fuck? I'm torn. I'd love to see her start. Well, okay, I'm just going to put my slideshow on for you. There we go. And great. Um, great. Thank you. Thanks, Allie. And thanks, um, thanks so much, Mid Coast Conservancy, uh, for inviting me. And thank you so much for all that you do to take care of the, the place, the lands and waters that we love so much and care so much about. Um, and thanks to all of you for coming and for your interest in this. It's really a complex topic and a hot topic, it seems. Um, so glad that you're here. And uh, so I'm beaming in from Freeport. And um, Freeport, along with um, Mid Coast, Maine, and the region where many of you are, are all traditional lands of the Wabanaki. And I want to acknowledge that um, and the long, long history and, and of, of uh, care um, that we've enjoyed there here and uh, and still enjoy it. Um, okay, I so this photo is actually taken um, from my little beach in, in Freeport and I just felt like giving a shout out to all the public places, the places where um, we can just go. This is actually owned by the town of Freeport. It's in my neighborhood. It's just a little tiny speck of a beach. It's a clam flat and um, a source of inspiration for me. So just felt like starting that way. Um, so the, 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 the title we gave for the topic is rewilding, which is this sort of big word right now. And, um, and, and uh, there are, there are, there's, I don't know if there's an agreed upon definition, but I think when we're talking about rewilding, oftentimes rewilding with the big R, um, we're talking about conservation efforts aimed at restoring and protecting natural processes and wilderness areas including providing connectivity uh, between such areas. So um, we can do this on a small scale as well. And, and it all helps, it really does. And this is what I would call rewilding um, in the, with a little r, little r rewilding. Um, yeah, I don't know if there's an agreed upon definition on that. So I really came up with some of my own. Um, to me, rewilding a yard or a landscape means managing it in a way um, that encourages and supports biodiversity and the ecosystem and contributes to con connectivity as well. So it's really all those same things, but on a smaller scale. Um, and it means thinking of an ecosystem as the whole, whole system thinking. To me, it means that. Um, in, in both cases though, we're talking about caring for land, hopefully with, um, with some or a lot of humility. Rewilding suggests a paradigm shift also. Um, a, a shift back perhaps in some ways as we relearn how to work in relationship with the natural world as part of the natural world as if we are members of the natural world which we are um, so it's about sharing rather than dominating and taking it's 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 a cultural shift it's re reciprocity and it's a cultural shift um, living in relationship with the natural world with all beings of the natural world and the respect, gratitude, and traditions that go with that, well, indige indigenous people have been doing this and doing it here for eons. It is important and crucial that indigenous ways of know knowing are acknowledged, valued, and I hope deeply listened to, and that indigenous lives and life ways everywhere are protected. So why not let mother just let mother nature rewild herself um and yes yes uh we do need to allow her to do that and here here's an illustration of her doing that beautifully with a mullen on the left and I'm not sure maybe a um evening primrose in the pavement on the right um and um so uh but we humans uh have also done a lot of damage in the short time we've been here well specifically the colon you know colonist and industrial society has done a lot of damage um so it's our responsibility to and our and also our need honestly um to learn what we can do um and to support the healing of our natural world which is to say support the healing of ourselves uh, 
So I want to tell you a little bit about how I got into all of this. Um, it's, I don't know, it's a chicken and the egg. It either started with the trees or it started with the bees. Um, I was taking a class at SMCC, the Southern Maine um, Community College in uh, Woody Plants. And um, my task was to, I was given the task of writing a paper or something project. And I chose, I wanted to do a project on uh, what are be what are tr what are trees that which trees support and shrubs support bees the most? And in my mind, I was thinking honeybees. My parents had just gotten um, honeybees, and a friend had, and I thought, wow, we, we could learn what are what what will they need? And so when I was doing that research, um, well, I learned that there aren't just honeybees in the world, but there are a lot of species of native bee, native wild bee, um, and that honeybees are imported, and and there are really, I think just maybe a couple of species of them here um, imported and they're wonderful for honey and, and whatnot. Um, but the, there are also 270, 270 species of native bee um, in Maine. I think it's like, maybe it's 20,000 worldwide. I'm not sure what that number is, but it was 270 species in Maine. Some of which are bumblebees down here on the right and sweat bees on the left. Um, so that what a, what a huge number that was, and I was as I was pondering that number that week was um, it was or it was April, and I was walking down my in my neighborhood. I was just walking down the street, and I was thinking, wow, two hundred and seventy species of wild native bee. That's amazing, and I don't even know these bees, and so I'm walking down the street, and I heard the sound above my head, and um, and I looked up, and there was this red maple blooming these outrageous blossoms and um and i could hear i i couldn't figure it out at first but anyway i realized it was all these tiny tiny little bees all over those blossoms they had probably just come out um and so this picture isn't that because i didn't i didn't have a i didn't take a picture and i couldn't find a picture of um of the little they were probably maybe they were mason bees i think that I saw, I'm not sure. Um, and they would have been much smaller than the honeybee, but anyway, this was the picture I found um, on the free Wiki Commons thing. And uh, so anyway, that just got me really excited about the connection between bees and trees and shrubs. And I just kept kind of going in this direction um, and realizing that these native bees had associations with native shrubs and trees that were really important to know about. So. Um, and I had a, um, I had a shady kind of garden and actually I had thought about keeping honeybees. It didn't really, wasn't really the right kind of place for honeybees because it's too shady. And then I realized, oh, I can have native bees. I already did. I just hadn't seen them. I hadn't noticed them. Um, so, and it was, just, and it's a suburban situation where I live. Um, and so then I just thought, well, and I was trying to grow some vegetables this was about 15 years ago. I, the vegetables, it was also a little too shady for vegetables. So I decided to make my, my yard an offering. Um, and, um, and so that was sort of how that happened. I read some books um, that really changed how I looked at things, including Bringing Nature Home by Doug Talony. Um, later on, a few years later, I read Braiding Sweetgrass, which also had a really big impact on how I um, thought about things. And I'm still reading that one again and again. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm passionate about this topic because, well, all these reasons I think I just told you, but um, I've also just learned that suburban yards can support a remarkable number of species, um, a, a remarkable amount of plant diversity and other species. And it's really not hard to get there to, to, um, to have an impact. A, a small things can go a long way. Um, so I love that. And, um, Yes, the small thing like restoring a patch of native viburnum that was given, getting overgrown with bittersweet or something like that, um, or putting out a bird bath, it just can make a really big difference. Um, and, and you'll see the differences. We see the differences. You, many, many of you probably have know this already and have done this. I mean, it's incredible. So rewilding practices, um, here are some are some that I came up with that I've been thinking about a lot um, over the years. Um, and um, by the way, I 
usually I use the term slow gardening. And I think I chose that term for myself. I just sort of identified with it. I learned later there's someone who like came up with the term slow gardening. But, um, but for me, I'm a slow gardener who really wants to spend a lot of time um, looking up um, caterpillars and, um, and maybe making tea from leaves and um, flowers and just doing different things in my garden other than just gardening. <laughs> so I'm a very slow gardener. Also, I like to kind of ponder um, and that sort of thing. And I like to putter. Um, so it's also, I would say it's also kind of slow gardening philosophy. Um, so, um, oh, one more thing about, I would just say, I also was thinking about how um, these are really more practices than they are tasks. It's not as much do this, do this. Um, for me, it's more here, things that I keep in mind while I do what I do <laughs> and some strategies in there. Um, great, so, uh, so this is my favorite of all the practices is, is just um, listening and learning, making friends with plants um, and bugs and, um, and study, studying and really studying the plants that are already there and appreciating um, the plants that are already there. And so, um, so I, you know, if you're interested at the, in this, I, I really recommend so highly um, putting time and energy and um, into identifying plants and learning how to do that. And, you know, it could be identifying plants and it could also just be getting to know plants. It's not always important to know the names of the plants. In fact, a lot of times it's not important. Um, but sometimes with the names of the plants, we can learn a lot about the plants, whether it's common names or scientific names, they all have information in those names. Um, and I really love the, I love learning about the names and the why of names. Um, so, but there are many ways to get to know a plant. Um, and, uh, Let's see, so with plant ID, um, with plant identification, I just feel like um, when we get to know the plants and the beings that are, live among us, we, we really begin to care about them. We also just learn, once we know about them, we're aware of them, we just see them more and more. We become more aware and we notice the connections between them. Um, so for identifying plants, I. Um, it's not always easy to do when they're first popping up at all. And it's also not easy to do when there's a lot of plants going on in one small section. Um, I use a field guide combined with um, an online source such as GoBotany. Um, GoBotany is, the, is um, run by Native Plant Trust. It's a great online resource for this. And also iNaturalist I've recently started using. Um, but primarily, I, I usually start with a field guide. Um, and I would, there are a lot of great field guides out there. I don't think I need to even really name them because there are so many good ones. But sometimes it, it might be, if you have a really old field guide, they can be really good for some reasons. But sometimes, it, particularly if you're really visually oriented, it can be nice to have a field guide with pretty good pictures, especially when you're getting started, as it was for me. Um, and so, uh, Let's see. So even in a small yard, it can take a long time to identify the species and they're going to, some are going to pop up in different um, times of the, the year. Um, so this one, like the other practices, this one I would definitely say is just an ongoing practice. Um, just something to just keep doing, keep plugging away at. Um, and so there are many ways to know a plant, not just the names. Oops. Um, you can, if it's, you know, you can look it up and make sure it's safe to do this. But in this case, this is um, red clover and you can make tea with red clover. It's really wonderful medicinal plant. Many of our plants that are in our yards are medicinal plants. I mean, maybe all of them. <laughs> I don't even know about that, but it's possible that they all have some kind of medicinal quality. They certainly all have qualities and active ingredients and such. Um, but you want to use care, absolutely, if you're going to make tea with a plant, I wanna make sure it's okay to do that. Um, and um, another thing I do uh, as part of this practice would be giving thanks to the plants um, and really um, offering gratitude for, for the plants who are already right there with you in your yards. Um, also notice things like where the animals flock to, where the bees and the caterpillars are, what they're doing, where the butterflies and moths are and the wasps. Um, and their behaviors, spiders. 
notice all the critters and um, and also consider the, the world below ground. What may be happening there? I don't have a photograph of the world below ground. We have above ground bias, don't we? Um, but uh, when we remember um, so, so much is happening down there that we don't know. So much is happening everywhere that we don't know. Our yard is our universe and it's, and, um, and it's a dynamic ecosystem. Your practices will affect how dynamic and lively the ecosystem is. So walk around and um, also take note of the plants growing along the roadsides and at your neighbor's place and, and the natural areas nearby because you'll find plant communities in the natural areas and some in places with really lovely ecological integrity where you have groups of plantings, plants that are growing together that have been together for a long time and have associations with each other. You can learn so much from doing that, just from learning the plants around in your region. Um, so that was the, the first practice, a bunch of stuff about the first practice. Um, another practice, we can't really talk about rewilding without talking about not dewilding. I think a lot of times we're dewilding. So um, this is so important. Um, and there are so many maintenance practices that you can do differently. You can consider changing up and see if you can dewild a little less by changing up some of those, those maintenance practices, such as like mowing, for example. Um, um, the maintenance practices sometimes will interrupt life cycles that you don't really want to interrupt. Um, and, um, and you don't want to interrupt that system in the middle of its process. So, um, so here are some examples. One thing uh, most of us could probably do is mow a little less. Um, just, just that one. Um, we, I, we started putting off our first mow. Uh, I think we mow now around Memorial Day weekend, which is pretty late for a lot of people. There are a lot of people that wouldn't be able to stand that, but you could try that one time, I bet, and just see what happens, see if anything's different there. Um, you'll have some little flowers in your, in your yard that'll go to seed, and maybe that's okay, maybe that's a good thing. So, um, so you could think about doing that. Um, you could also mow at a different level, a higher level, and that actually can really help. That really does help enliven your soil when you do that, these things actually. Um, um, another thing is uh, to treat the leaves as the gifts that they are. Um, Talk about leaves them. contain multitudes. Not only do they contain nutrients for your, for your trees and your shrubs and wherever they're dropping, um, they're also, they also contain egg sacs and uh, habitat in a lot of places where insects are going to winter mm -hmm. over um, and um, yeah, and contribute to your whole cycle, your whole, the whole life cycle there. So, um, and many, many moths and other, and insects overwinter in the leaf, in this leaf, what we call leaf litter. I'm, I think it's a shame we call it leaf litter. I'd love for that yeah. not to be what we call it. Um, by sucking up the leaves in a vacuum or chopping them up, you are, um, they are lost, they're, they're, they're gone. So they're not gonna be there for your, for your land. Um, Woman. So, but by leaving the leaves, you're allowing what the trees and shrubs intended, which is to resupply the soils and plants. And, yeah, with, um, through the winter and the following year. Um, is there a place for leaf blowers? Um, I don't know. I think that some people use their leaf blowers for the patio or the driveway or something. Um, I don't really think leaf blowing and rewilding go together, but um, I also think there are some quieter leaf blowers. I usually just hear the loud ones. Um, so, but I do think there must be some quieter ones. I think in my neighborhood, there are a lot of industrial ones. Um, yep, and, I, I, and I wonder about how they affect um, the hearing of birds and, um, and insects. Uh, it, the sound, the volume or the frequency, I don't know, but I just wonder what the effects are. Um, let's see. 
I have a small yard. Um, I have a, yeah, I have a small yard and it's, so it's no trouble for me to rake my leaves under the shrubs. And I do chop, I chop a bunch of them up, um, like about half of them probably. So I do chop some up and then the rest I just put under the leaves. The ones I chop up, I put in my compost and they do, they're really good there. Um, so it's a, it's a combination of things, it's not any one thing. And I might, if I sound a little luxury, it's because I'm offering a lecture, <laughs> but, but actually really what I mean to say is these are options. And, um, and sometimes you can try a little of this. That's really what I'm trying to offer is some, some ideas of things to try. Um, bright, uh, bright lights outside, that's another thing that can be damaging, that are actually damaging to moths. And, um, and that contributes to light pollution, which then it's also not good for bats. So um, we have transitioned to um, you know, these little solar lights in the ground. Um, and then we also have a few um, sensor lights that are solar and those work great. Or, or sensor lights that aren't solar are fine too. I mean, because then they just go on when you need them. Um, so that's another great thing you can do. Um, oh, this was supposed to be when I was talking about the mowing at a higher level. Anyway, you can see we've got some bluets here. Um, no need to tidy up. Um, <laughs> You can tidy up if you want to, of course. Um, but we do, we tend to have a tendency to treat the outsides of our houses the way we treat the insides of our houses. Um, but that's not really appropriate unless we're talking about, you know, right near the, right, right near next to the house. Maybe you have these areas you really do want to keep tidy. That's fine. But there are also probably a lot of other areas that if you leave them like this, well, the birds are going to come and they'll be able to find seeds and they'll be able to, um, they might be able to find some insects actually in some of the stalks. And then what insects they don't find, those insects will be able to hatch in the spring and contribute to the health of the ecosystem there. So, um, so leaving the, the flower stalks through the fall, you can cut them early in the spring. That's a good time to do it if you wanna cut them. That's when I do it. Uh, actually a little later in the spring, I try to let things kind of, I, I wait. I do my gardening a little later, I have to say. I don't really get into my garden. Um, for some things I do, like if I'm trying to start vegetables early or something, but for flower gardening, I actually wait. I wait as long as I can. Um, and so, uh, let's see, keep the cats inside for obvious reasons. Um, if, there, if, if there are cats in the neighborhood also, uh, make sure to have your bird bath sited far, you know, in a place where a cat isn't going to be able to just um, hide and then get them, get the birds. So same with the bird feeders. Bird baths are, bird baths are really wonderful for birds. Um, I think cats, I think I blocked out, I blocked, I remember hearing how many birds die from cats and it's just, I have blocked out that number because it's so horrible. Um, and just to think that there are birds now arriving from Costa Rica or they're about to from places um, that they might get just knocked out by a cat is a bummer, really more than a bummer. Um, okay, so um, another thing I do in my yard and um, is I leave uh, leave a dead tree or two around um, that can be a source for food and habitat for for the critters. And there is actually tons of life in a dead tree. It's kind of funny that they're called dead trees. Yes, the tree is dead, but there's a lot of life in them. And so here, this hole was probably made by a woodpecker and a, perhaps this chickadee is, um, it, maybe this is a nest for the chickadee, I'm not sure. And um, there's just so much food in a dead tree. And if you do leave a dead, leave dead trees around, you'll see that those are some of the hot spots in your yard because every, everybody goes to them. Um, in my, I'm in a suburban environment where most people don't leave their dead trees. I just have one right now that's a dead birch. And it's okay kind of because um, it, the birches, they just break off in little sections from the top down and there's no kids playing where that birch is. And so it's fine. If a little chunk comes off, it's okay. But don't leave a dead tree, obviously, if it's not in a safe place or if it's gonna take down the 
power line or something. Um, right, and so just with, the, and with any of these practices, just notice what happens when you do any of them. Notice, notice what happens and then um, and adjust as you wish and as you feel is right for you. Um, herbicides, pesticides, and fungicides and synthetic fertilizers don't, I don't think have a place really in rewilding, at least not on, um, on our scale, on a smaller scale, I, I wouldn't say generally. Um, if, if, if you've got a situation with a nuisance moth or something that's truly threatening your favorite tree, find out what's, um, what's going on uh, with the life cycle of the, of, of the problem, of, of the, you know, the insect. Um, and is it a situation where you can have some patience and just let it sort of run its course? Because a lot of times these things will run their course, but not always, not always. In fact, here's an ash behind here. And um, we have to really protect the ashes now, I think. Um, so um, uh, the, so I guess, you know, that these, the pesticide is really a last resort. Um, I don't even know what else to say about that. Um, but if you did think you needed to do a, use a pesticide, I just think with any of these things, you really, you really want to do a lot of research on the chemicals, the active ingredients in the products that are recommended and find out exactly what's going to happen, exactly which and how many species will be killed. And then what happens if a bird comes and eats that insect or whatever? If you don't know that, like you'd have to really go into it with eyes wide open and all, and it's not. So I'm going to say that's enough on that, but I just, that's how I feel about that. Um, hopefully you do too. Um, okay, protect the diversity you have. Um, so, oh, so this photograph is, um, we have sumac, it just looks like jewels. It was taken in the fall right near um, my mechanics shop. Um, it's sumac, which is a native species, um, which it, uh, does behave pretty aggressively. And um, we have the invasive knotweed here in the middle um, and up there, um, which is classified as a, to behave invasively here in Maine, unfortunately. Um, and so, you know, you you might have yard, you have, might have plants in your yard that behave invasively that you're probably gonna, um, maybe you already are kind of trying to manage them or maybe you're just trying to keep them from expanding. Um, that's a really valuable thing to do because they do, will they will take over the native species and displace them um, pretty quickly and pretty intensely. So um, do what you can to educate yourselves about th these different species. They're not all the same. Um, you want to be consistent with the, whatever practices you choose. You want to be methodical and consistent. Um, and you also want to be able to be ready to um, replace a plant, have a plant ready to replace, put in its place if you can. Um, so these are ongoing practices along with any rewilding practices for sure. Um, about another thing about these plants, which I actually don't, I try, I do say the word invasive species, but I like to say the plant is just, it's a plant that behaves invasively in Maine because wherever it originally came from it, it, it fit in its ecosystem, and, but here it, it's different and it's, um, it's not checked by, you know, a thousand years of co-evolution. And so, um, um, but I just think we, I think we have to be careful about how we talk about the plants and we don't want to, we also don't really want to demonize them. We have to work with them. We have to work with these invasives and we have to keep at, at it. Um, but if we are kind of go at it with like a war mentality, We'll just we'll burn ourselves out. We'll probably cause some destruction, unnecessary destruction, and um, it's not very fun. But if you can work with these plants, and even if you're cutting them or whatever you're doing, um, pulling them maybe. I actually tend to cut rather than pull um, to disturb the soil less. Um, but whatever you know, if you can, you can also appreciate the role that they're filling 
you can appreciate the, the gifts that they are offering, even though you're still going to cut them. <laughs> um, so it just has to do with, I think, the gesture that you bring to that um, that project and that that task. It it matters, and I and I say this from experience because I've worked with them so much, and I used to get really upset <laughs> working with them, and um, so I just have a different attitude. And honestly, all these plants are here to teach us stuff. We're, we're um, and it's a great attitude and perspective to take with the plants is really what can we learn from them and so with a uh, species that's invasive that behaves invasively we can ask this question what are they here to teach us um they've taught me a lot already and i'm i'm quite sure they're not done um yeah there's definitely some paradoxes going on here you're not imagining things um i also think we need to be careful about how we talk about um I think I said that before, but I just wanted to say one more thing about that, how we talk about the plants. Most of the species were imported here by American institutions or the horticulture industry, the prestigious American institutions. So it's not the plant's fault that they're here, and nor is it the, orig the, um, the original host region's fault. Um, it's such a fascinating topic. A lot of things about this are fascinating, and I love to keep talking about it, but I can't because I have to keep moving on. And I bet you want to keep moving on because people don't really like to talk about it usually. Um, and, and so here is, here are, on the left is witch hazel who's growing under, um, in this forest canopy and that's sort of under middle story, the forest canopy. And on the right is one of our native viburnums. Um, actually, I think that's cranberry, high bush cranberry. I get it mixed up with um, the maple leaf cranberry. I think it's the high bush cranberry um, and um, viburnum. And um, these are just examples of, of plants, shrubs and trees living on the edge. In both cases, they're in my town where there are invasive species that behave invasively very nearby. And if I'm not there or somebody doesn't um, come and defend them, they will, they will get swallowed up. Um, so it's, it's so great to get to know these plants so that we can know to do that. Um, okay. All right. Um, about, so shrinking your lawn is, is a wonderful thing to do if you can do it. Um, and it's a really fun thing to do. I think it might be why I was invited here today. Um, so lawns, obviously they can be really, really practical and lovely and they smell great when they're cut. Um, and so they, they, they really can be very handy. There's so much you can do on the lawn. We, we yeah, we play croquet or whatever, badminton. Um, lacrosse, the girls used to play lacrosse there, right there, and obviously our dog. Um, they're not devoid of ecological benefit. Actually, they do bring benefit, but it's nothing compared to what the non-lawn part of your yard is um, because it's pretty much a monoculture. I mean, just about. And it's, um, it's also really not at all natural, which is why there's a whole industry around keeping them going. Um, so anyway, a great thing to do for rewilding, it would be to just sh shrink your lawn a little bit. And the way I did it was I did it um, a little bit at a time um, over the course of about four years. And um, yeah, so um, now we've probably reduced it by about a third. And it used to take us 45 minutes to mow it. And now it takes about 25 minutes to mow it. So um, that's a great thing to consider. Um, and the way I did it was, um, the first year we really just mowed, we just moved the, we, so see the rope here. Um, this rope we put down to just to help us see where the new line would go. So it's really just a couple of feet that first year. Um, and we wanted, um, so it would show us where that line would go. And so we really just didn't mow there. And what happened was mostly it was um, uh, violets came in from, from the edges and uh, wild strawberry and some ferns came in. And it wasn't, I don't recall that when it was like, there's a lot of moss sort of over in the corner. So that was just mossy, that was fine. 
um, we, we put the line that way with the curve because there's this tree, I don't know if you can see it, but there's a hawthorn above and there's no reason to mow under a tree. You might as well just have that not mowed. That, why is that even lawn? So that's sort of how we started, was just moving the line a little bit, but um, I don't really remember. I think it got a little messy that, and I really, really wanted to plant a whole lot of plants in there and just fill it up, but I didn't have the budget for that. Um, and so at the same time, Wild Seed Project was just sort of starting up and I took, I didn't take a class. I just did a, like a, I don't know, I went to a lecture um, and learned how to just get started with growing native plants from seed through, through Heather McCargo and Wild Seed Project. And I just got started. And um, so I did that. And the next year I might've had a little bit to plant in. It wasn't a lot, I remember getting bunch of ferns from a neighbor, you know, just some plants that would fill in kind of quickly. Um, and, um, and things did. I don't really remember how this jewelweed, jewelweed is on the left, this light colored one um, kind of showed up over the vinca. The vinca had been there already. Um, and there's the ostrich fern back there, which I had gotten from a friend and it colonized rapidly and it just really liked that area. Sometimes you'll try something, it'll really work in your area and you don't really know why. We know it's a wettish area and it's shade, you know, fair amount of shade and wet. Doesn't necessarily need shade, but anyway, um, we were kind of lucky with that spot. And then, um, then once I started getting the plants going, I had a lot of plants. Actually, I was able to generate a lot of plants. I didn't know I would have succeed growing plants from seed like this, um, the Wild Seed Project way. Um, I'd, I hadn't had a lot of experience with anything like that or any experience really. So that was a bit of a shock, um, but I was, I guess I started with pretty easy plants and there are plants that are easy to start with. And then I just had this volume and I was able to plant in these along where I wanted to expand the lawn. So that was great. Um, but you can also buy them. You can buy plants and you can save money by buying plugs instead of buying whole plants. Um, so there are different ways to do it. And you can do it without even planting a lot. And um, um, you know, you can try just by weeding. You know, you you allow the ones that you want, like the um, you know, some something more like a ground cover, like the violets and the uh, wild strawberry or whatever you might have there that's a ground cover. Um, and you just allow that to happen and weed out what you don't want. That's another way to do it. I think the third year I did it. When I like the third year, I was continuing to expand. Um, I was getting better at it, and I actually put down newspaper along the whole line that I wanted. Newspaper and then mulch, and then I planted into that. So I got better over here. And then, so here, this picture shows how um, it used. To, this used to all be lawn, and we used to mow around these trees. So we'd mow around the birch and mow around the kusa dogwood and mow around the ash. And um, and that was pretty goofy. Now when I no, I don't know. I just when I think about it, I was like, wow, why did we even do that? Um, because now it's just so great that we don't have to do that. And the first three years, um, there was some work for sure. We actually we cut a path with just with the mower. Maybe I would do it with a weed whacker if I had a weed whacker, but just cut a, a couple of paths in where it's getting really wild so you can get through there. You're gonna want to get through there for fun so you can take your coffee or tea through there um, or your guests will meander through the, those paths and enjoy what they see. Um, and you also really wanna have paths because if you've got these kind of wild, more wild areas, you're also probably gonna get, not probably, you are gonna get a lot of other plants that you don't necessarily want. When you get an area that's like, that's really filling in like this, you also are gonna get a ton of birds, um, insects, and you're gonna hear all the insects in there and you're gonna get a lot of birds and activity. And so then you're gonna get bird droppings. And then in those bird droppings, you're gonna get seeds. So some of that will be happy, but sometimes you're gonna get um, a species you really don't want. And um, so you need to be able to get into those, those wild places too get out whatever you don't want. Um, I felt like it was especially in those first three years that I had to really maintain it. This past year, 
I did almost nothing that I remember. Um, so let's see. Um, okay. Um, sorry, I'm going to go back for a sec. Just want to make sure I got everything. I went off my script. Um, yeah. Oh, I know what I was going to say. Um, if you're considering shrinking your lawn, and there's so many reasons to kind of do it in slow, a little bit slowly, one of which is that your, your housemate, if your housemate isn't sure they want to shrink their lawn, that, that sometimes happens. Um, and so if you just do it in little bits, you can win them over. I'm sure you can do it. Um, you will win them over. And the other thing is you might want to offer to do the mowing for a little while just to make sure that the line that you wanted is the line that you get. Um, yeah, that was what I, and that's like important information to, uh, uh, to share with you, I think. Um, it's, it, it, it's, you know, shrinking the lawn, it, you won't be sacrificing anything. Um, y y you'll reduce your gas consumption and you'll, you'll reduce the mower bill if you have a hired mower, but by doing less and consuming less, you'll be creating abundance for yourself and for others. So um, there's pretty good reasons to shrink your lawn. Um, and yes, it is, there's a, this kind of leap of faith with this. And, um, and then if you don't like it, you can mow it. Um, okay, so, Yeah, it's a really big topic, cultivating native plants and others. I meant other native, other plants, not just natives. Um, but I, I have, I personally have focused on natives because I really love them and I love the life that they bring. Um, and I have, and I, yeah, I see the value there, but I also really love edible plants and tea plants, herbal er, herbs. So I have, I have a variety of plants in my yard. I am careful about what I plant though. Um, but what, you know, what per perhaps you've discovered this too, when you plant a native plant, how, how much life comes. Um, and uh, there is a saying you might've heard called, if you plant it, they will come. And uh, the, this is a swamp milkweed here, the pink one on the left. Um, so swamp milkweed is one of three, four or so milkweeds we have in the region. And um, it generally it grows in a wetland area, but it can grow in your garden and it can grow fine in your garden actually, um, probably, um, mine does. And it's not in a particularly wet area, um, but you'll see, so there's a monarch caterpillar on there. Um, so the monarch caterpillars, they, the milkweeds will be host, all the milkweeds are host to mon mon monarch caterpillars. It's not just the common milkweed that's so common that we know of. Um, and so the, this caterpillar was probably born, you know, as the egg probably hatched somewhere on this plant and it just started eating and now it's this size. But see, the, there's another bug over here. I forgot to, I didn't look this one up. I looked it up last summer. It's either called like the red spotted milkweed bug, uh, beetle or the red milkweed beetle. There, it turns out there are several there are actually several insect species that associate just with milkweed, like the way the monarch does. Um, that's something I didn't know until recently. Um, so there are these plants where if you plant them, these very specific species will come. And that's a really cool thing to do. Um, and I have done that. Usually I plant according to you know, my conditions and I think this plant will grow well here, but once in a while it's like, I heard about the spice bush swallowtail and I thought that sounded really cool. So I planted a spice bush and I've been told that by year three, you'll get this, the spice bush swallowtail will come and, and live there. And that, that plant will be the host plant for, for your spice bush swallowtail. Um, we've had the spice bush for two years. So I'm hoping this summer spice, spice bush swallowtail will come. We'll see. Um, and you know, we hear a lot of times we, people talk about attracting bees attracting butterflies, attracting birds. 
Um, but it, what I think about is not so much attracting them, but actually sustaining them, really sustaining them. And what, what does that mean? And host plants do that. Host plants aren't just offering the nectar. They're also um, offering the plant up. Um, and they are the plant that um, a, a life cycle of the, um, of the insect will, will need. And so it's just a little difference there. On the right side, there's a um, blue lobelia um, with a bumblebee. And um, both of these plants I grew from seed to pop populate my yard. And I think they were both pretty easy, but I would say the blue lobelia was quite easy, just in case you're interested in what's really easy to grow from seed. Um, so um, this is, we're, here we have um, our pussy willow, when pussy willow is maybe the first to bloom in Maine, I'm not sure. I think I know there is a witch, uh, witch hazel, the um, Bernalis, I think, um, that's blooming now, which is sort of native-ish, maybe native to a region just south of here. I'm not exactly sure. But anyway, witch hazel, uh, willows, one, one of the first, if not the first, um, to bloom in the spring. So very, very important for, um, for the bees. Um, um, and I wanted to show you, I just wanted to show you a couple of slides and just talk about um, the woody plants, the trees and shrubs, because the, the, the woody species support such a, such a huge, such a tremendous variety of life. Um, a lot of times when people are talking about pollinators, they're talking about their gardens and that's great because we can do so much with the gardens or with fields and meadows and things. But the trees and the shrubs are so important for a lot of reasons. Um, they produce large volume of leaves. Well, the willows don't as much, but the trees do. Um, leaves that insects rely on as a food source. And so these trees and shrubs are essential for us supplying the songbirds with the massive numbers of caterpillars that they will need to raise their young. Um, so it's crucial in our yards to have lots and lots of caterpillars um, because it's the caterpillars that those songbirds need. They, they're squishy and small and can fit down the throats of the little birds. Um, so we can just get a lot of bang for the buck with working with trees and shrubs, whether it's um, supporting the pollinators or the Lepidoptera, which is the butterflies and moths. Um, and I just wanted to include a picture of the high bush blueberry because it's just behaving so gorgeously here, looking so gorgeously. and um, and it's, I just had this slide around and it's such a good one also for, um, for that fall color. And when you're looking for an alternative to maybe to burning bush, um, this is a great alternative. Um, let's see, um, this is my yard again. Mostly I'm focusing, I didn't really explain that, but I just thought I would focus my, on my yard so I could just tell the story of how, how I've learned um, and things have progressed here. Um, so it'll be tempting, I, it, it'll be so tempting to choose the plant species first and then see if you can stick it in your yard or somewhere. And that's kind of what I do over and over again. <laughs> um, and, and that's okay. Um, and, and, but make sure to also consider your site and the needs of your site. And I know that sounds, that's kind of obvious, but it's just one of these things that we all need to be reminded again of it again and again. So it's it's the soil, it's the lighting, it's the moisture. Um, what are the what buildings are around? Um, what activity is around? What are the management kind of practices going to be or not? Um, all those things will steer what's possible for you, or what's at least what's likely to have success. Um, Right plant, right place is another really popular adage. And, and so it's also really helpful to know what are the conditions that that species that you're looking at grows in. Um, and it's, it may, may or may not be enough to look at the tag at the nursery. It may be that you're better off doing a little more research um, 
particularly when you're talking about the native species, it's great to go to um, one of the websites that's really knowledgeable about the native species. And I even go to Go Botany sometimes to look up what is the, um, what are the conditions that this plant is found in, in nature? Because when I'm doing, for my gardening that I do, I always look to nature as um, my teacher, but also in my guide. Uh, because if it's growing in the natural world, over here on the right, you see uh, um, cardinal flowers, this red one. And cardinal flower does grow in, around in Maine. Um, but I had never seen it or I don't remember having seen it before. And so one time I was on a hike and I saw it on the edge of a pond. Um, it was really breathtaking. And, um, but I'll always remember that because I'll always remember now that the cardinal flower um, grows in a wetland because I saw it where it actually grows. It's so helpful to know that. And so if you don't know, you just, you can look it up. Um, so things like that, there's just a lot to know. Um, and you're not going to know it all. You don't know it all. I don't, um, we, we kind of look things up. We, we try stuff um, and we ask, we go to good sources for advice. And if we go to good sources, you know, we're going to have some good success, I think. Um, so what else could I say? Um, so this brings me to the topic of, um, I'm showing you now that I've got these sort of resource lists and what we can do is maybe we can put them in an email to send to you as a follow-up email. Um, these are some resources that have been really, really helpful to me um, in my journey. So I've written them down, websites, workshops, and classes that I've done, um, and some authors that I recommend um, and that have really influenced me and just helped so much. It's all part of my acknowledgement also, my acknowledgement and thanks to these great um, organizations and people writers and such. Um, buying plants and seeds um, is another big topic, an important topic, uh, where you get your seeds from and your plants from. Um, Midcoast Conservancy is, is currently compiling a list of um, places to buy native plants. I know Midcoast Conservancy also has its own seed sale, which is wonderful. Um, and, and they can, um, maybe I can help contribute to their list, but anyway will follow up or maybe Allie will follow up. We can talk about that during Q&A. Um, if you go to a nursery, when and if you go to a nursery, it's really great to bring your list with you when you go because <clears throat> again, from experience, I know when you leave a nursery, you might have, you might, you might just walk out with a bunch of plants that really aren't the right ones. Um, that depends on who you talk with at the nursery, though. Sometimes there are, some, there are some nurseries with really, really great staff that can definitely help you. It just sort of depends. Um, so it is helpful to bring a list. Um, and when you're there, ask where the plants are from. See if they know. They, they, can't, they don't always know. They can't always know. Um, but you can ask. And, and you, in doing so, you're letting them know that it matters to you. And the reason I'm saying this about where they're from is because um, the, the more local they are, um, the more the more likely they're actually gonna do really well for you in your place. Um, and they will have adapted to con more con to conditions here. So provenance is a, is a really good thing to know about. Um, it's also great to know if they have ever been treated by a pesticide. Um, that's really important because there are some systemic pesticides um, that will stay in the plant and will stay on the bee um, and really just keep going and going and going. So. Um, that's another great message to get across to any nurseries that you want to make sure your, your plants are clean. And I know more nurseries are aware of this now and, and are trying. Um, you still need to ask. Um, you might ask if, there, if you're interested in this. We're not having time tonight to talk about straight species native plants versus cultivars. Straight species is more like close with the, the wild species. Um, so like let's say uh, winterberry holly are really popular right now. And we also have them, um, many of them all, that grow all around us, beautiful with the red berries that people collect in um, around the holidays. And so you could ask, um, is this a, a straight species, like a wild winterberry holly, or is it a cultivar? And so a cultivar would have been um, um, the nursery industry takes the cultivar and um, 
I don't want to say messes with it, but makes it um, more sellable um, in mass growing and, and selling in mass amounts. Um, and also they are grown, uh, grown clonally. And so you're not getting the genetic diversity if you get the cultivar, but that's, you know, that's just one thing. And if you end up with the cultivar, that is okay. It really is. Um, some people want to just try to get as much as possible straight species of, of, a, of a plant, but we'll see what you can get, you know? And maybe we'll make progress toward getting more straight species in the future also when we ask this question. Um, some resources for native seeds, also Wild Seed Project and Edgewood Nursery. Oh, Ed, Wild Seed, Edgewood is a pretty small place, but, um, but they do have some good ones. And then Prairie New, Moon Nursery and Prairie Nursery are not local. There's another one called Earth Seeds, also not local, that are all really good, reliable. But local is better. If you can get them through Wild Seed Project or Edgewood, um, those are going to be the best adapted to the, this area. And also, the yeah. Well, I'll just leave it there. That's good. Um, but they're all good companies. Okay. And I won't spend much time on this, but I just to say like, here's what it looked like. Here's what it kind of looks like when I do it, when I sow my seeds. Um, and on the left, this is from Wild Seed Project. Nice description. They do have some good guides for how to do this. And you can just do it on a really small scale just with a couple of pots. Um, you can do it inside. Um, I, I've done most of mine in the fall and I put them out for the winter. Nothing, they're not German, they haven't germinated yet. They look like just in the upper photo. They just look like that. And I put a little sand or soil on top and I put them out, they spend the entire winter out there. They get freeze thaw, freeze thaw. The seeds get this freeze thaw thing going, um, which they like, it helps them to germinate. There are actually a lot of native species that won't germinate without a pretty decent cold period. So, um, so that's how I often do it. But there are several um, native species that will that you can start in the spring um, that don't need the cold spirit uh, the cold period. So um, you can get those from Wild Seed Project. They'll know which ones. And um, yeah, so you can see how many plants in a little box. I mean, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of plants I had that first couple of years. They take a little longer to get going, I will say. Like you may not be able to plant them out until the following year, just a warning. But it's so worthwhile and it's $4 at the most for a packet of seeds. Maybe it's less than that. Okay. Um, um, okay, experiment. Um, yeah, experiment. And um, observe the changes. Notice who comes. Um, share and enjoy and and give thanks always give thanks and um, so this photograph is is a year later or one or two years later from it's really the same view as the photo with the cardinal flower in it now this one actually is a relative close relative of the cardinal flower this is blue lobelia and the cardinal flower is not in this picture um, so our yards are dynamic ecosystems um, so we can expect that they're going to be changing a lot it really does help to know this, even if we don't know exactly what that means, dynamic ecosystem. Because um, it, it's like, what does that mean? But, um, but that's okay. So, you know, you might start a patch of cardinal flower and maybe it doesn't, maybe it's not there the next year. It might show up in a different location another year. Um, that's pretty common, especially with the native species. They're, we're talking about wild species, you know. Um, so that's, that's how they behave in the wild. They're gonna behave in the, the way they do in the wild. They're not gonna behave like your, your, your yard just because they're in your yard. So some of them are really will stay put, but it's just, there are some that are gonna move around. Um, and, and you know, it's because there's another spot that kind of needs them, um, ecologically speaking. So it's kind of interesting. Um, and you can decide how much movement you wanna allow. Um, so rewilding is about giving up some of the control that we're used to having as gardeners. Um, but you know, you'll you'll want to have your tidy areas, of course. And, and so then just um, see, you know, one thing I do, I mean, there's just so much happens in our yards, um, whether we're rewilding or not, so much is happening. And so I have a plastic Adirondack chair that I just move around the yard. And actually sometimes this last summer I had a camp chair 
so I'm on the ground, I'm actually on the ground and I just move it all over the place. And it's like, I have this, our yard is only a quarter of an acre. It's not very big, but I have so many different views. I just take my chair and I, I just have so many different views and I can see so many different things with these portable chairs. So I recommend you do that if you don't already. Um, yeah, and look under leaves. This is, um, I just do a lot of looking under leaves. And then if you look and you don't see anything, look under another leaf or look again, because maybe there is something. Um, there's a little tiny, tiny milkweed caterpillar over here on the left um, in the middle. I don't know what that is. It's just that the leaf is folded over and there is somebody living in there for sure. That was along a, a roadside. And the one on the right, some flying insect. I don't know who it is, but so cool. I think maybe that's under the hawthorn. And more, you know, more and more, they just are they're always showing up. Um, right. Oh, I wanted to just say something about citizen science. Um, iNaturalist is something I just joined and that's sort of a, that has a citizen science element to it. Um, I also have a, um, a journal called the Nature Notebook. Nature Notebook, I think, yeah, it's by Nat Wheelwright and Bern Heinrich. And it's a great way of tracking your, the phenology, like the, you know, when, when a flower blooms or when the robins show up or when you see a hummingbird moth, that's the one up on the right. Um, or when you see a painted lady, I don't know, you know, whenever, whatever insect or, or animal or plant you, you're seeing that's happening, you write it in this um, wonderful journal. I should have put that, I can put that on the list. I'll add that to the list of recommended things. Um, and I know there are a lot of other things like that out there and a lot of great citizen science projects that you could do. And it's a great thing to do with this. If you're re if you're doing this, you might as well like really document what's going on here in your yard um, because so much will change. So what else? Um, hmm. Yeah. Um, this just share what you're doing with your neighbors um, and your neighbors are probably gonna love to hear about it. Um, endless source of entertainment for them probably what you're doing over in your yard and um and there's so much to share and um what is it a joy shared is a joy doubled is that um maybe that's good to, i'm not sure um so another thing that i would say is oh yeah so this is our yard um this is actually taken from the street the road, the road curves around our yard. So we have this whole huge wild area all the way around. And, and we regularly hear families or people on the street saying, oh my gosh, look at that bee, look at that butterfly um, as they're walking around. So that's pretty cool. I feel like that for us, that really is another kind of offering to the neighborhood, um, which I don't know if it's just a fun thing to do. And when you are able to connect with your neighbors over these things, it's just, it's such a wonderful opportunity for connection with neighbors. Um, it's just so delightful to talk about it. And then you can talk about problems you have or a plant or is this a weed or whatever. Um, it's just a great bonding thing, I think. And so, yeah. Oh, this one is just, <laughs> um, how do you know when your, wild, your yard is too wild? That's what this one kind of shows we have. Um, too many I from in my for my taste um what are those dogwood sawflies and um oh, on my dogwoods and but you know what it's a life cycle I mean it they run their course and then they're gone um I actually helped some to another area this time because I was worried about them um and then on this one on the right that was right on the street I thought that was a cherry but now I'm looking at it I'm not sure on on a cherry tree but um Anyway, I was not around the week that it um, emerged, so I never knew what happened there, but maybe the neighbors noticed. I just decided to leave it. Why not? Um, okay. And, and how, anyway, this is how, how, how wild is too wild when the, when the um, 
pumpkin is growing on the window screen, that's too much. And then if it's really just too crazy, you could just take the mower, just do a mow every, you know, anytime you do a mow, it sort of tidies things up quite a bit. And um, also you can put an ornamental chair. That was another, <laughs> we got a hand-me-down ornamental chair and we just thought, wow, that just makes everything look proper and um, like a formal garden again, if that's what you need to do. So you could try that if you feel like it was just getting a little too wild. Um, and this is, I just wanted to put this picture in because I love it. Um, it's both pictures really, but it's a shagbark hickory and my mom standing with the shagbark hickory. And there she is on lands that her and her ancestors, she and her ancestors lived on. Um, for over 250 years in, in southern New Hampshire. And the, the nuts are from the shag bark. They're actually not from this shag bark. Um, a friend of mine gave me some nuts. It was right around the time of the photo though. And I, um, I actually put them in a pot and um, they germinated and they grew and I've planted a few shag bark hickory seedlings. And I just think of, I think of that place and the hickories there at that place. And, and then the question that I, end with here is a question that Robin Wall Kimmerer poses in her book, Braiding Sweetgrass, which um, is an evo evocative question that I, I ask myself sometimes, and I thought you might like it. And that's my, that's my, um, that's my show. And, but then we do have time for Q&A and I'm sorry I went over time. I'm not very practiced at this um, at all. So I'm gonna do, I think I do this too. Um, um, great. Well, thank you for that, Lucy. Can you hear me? Um, <laughs> yes. Okay, great. I, um, um, I think I have to do one more thing, which is... Okay, go. What, do I have to... Wait, do I have to... Am I still sharing my screen? Your screen is still shared, yes. Oh, stop share. There we go. There we go. There you are. Great. Okay. <laughs> and I'll... I'll be I'll be a, a face to go with my with my voice here. Um, so let me go ahead and share with you some of the questions that have come in. Um, several questions about sort of resources, and I'm thinking that um, we can include these in the email that I send out tomorrow with the link to this. Mm -hmm. um, but maybe if, if you want to speak to them, one was about um, wondering if you've got resources or contacts about replacing lawn with native plant communities. Um, and also where you can buy plant plugs. Mm, okay. Um, yeah, so the first one, replacing lawns. I mean, it's a, it's a process and a practice that's gonna take some planning and some design. Um, so like if you're doing it more than like what I did, which was just a, you know, a couple feet at a time. Um, so um, I would say the, that list of resources where I took courses, is a good place to go. So whether it's um, the botanical gardens would be a great place to go for this um, and the Wild Seed Project, those two, and also Native Plant Trust, that's three, um, to, for as far as resources for that. Um, also, I forgot to mention Wild Seed Project a week, I think it's a week from today, it might be, anyway, it's next week. They are offering a talk on rewilding, <laughs> so it'll be, you know, you could go to that one too and see how it's different from this one. They'll be a little different from each other, even though I'm very much influenced by them and, and have been. I used to be on the board there, um, but um, I'm gonna go to that one. I wanna see what they say. <laughs> so, um, and they also, they are doing a, um, a pledge kind of thing where you pledge to rewild your yard. So if you want to rewild your yard, you join the pledge and then you get an email once in a while that sort of cheers you on about that. So that actually could be a great thing for, um, for the person um, who just asked that, that question. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it means a week from week from now. So that's perfect. Um, what was the other question? There was um, where you could buy plant plugs. And then actually there was also a question about a local place to buy indigenous shrubs. So maybe. Yeah. Um, well, one time I bought a bunch of plugs from um, Native Plant Trust and that was terrific. They were really great quality. Um, that is down in Massachusetts. So you have to go to Massachusetts to get them. Um, there are other places where you can buy plugs. Um, 
There's one called Kind Earth Growers, and I think they ship. So there are some that ship. In fact, Prairie Moon Nursery ships, but those plants are coming from the Midwest, which is not as ideal. The closer you can get them to here, the better. Um, who else? Um, Pearson Nursery. No, Pearson is wholesale. Um, there's one in New Hampshire that does plugs. Van Berkham. Van okay. Berkham is another one. I, I don't know if you have to go to New Hampshire or how it works or if they're wholesale only. I just don't remember. That would be another great source for plugs. Um, and yeah. And then, and then, and also and maybe on your resource, on the resource list that you do, if you do yep. a list of um, native plant or places to get plants, you know, the two of us can talk about that because I actually have some other ideas. So, because there's also Maine Audubon will be having a plant sale and you'll be having a plant sale. Knox, and Knox, Knox Lincoln, Knox Lincoln is coming up. Yep, exactly. So, yeah, I, yeah. I will definitely include links to all of the upcoming sort of local. Yeah. Local plant native plant sales and things that are coming up that we know of um, mm -hmm. in the email tomorrow for sure yeah um well and i and i so i, I have to this lucy and i were talking earlier about when she was sort of inventorying um her her garden and and how many different uh, you've been keeping a, a log of how many different um yeah. was it bugs um well plants i started with plants okay. <laughs> but yeah, so one summer I um one summer I got pneumonia. It was walking pneumonia and I wasn't supposed to really do anything. So I just it was August, which is a terrible time to get it. Well, you don't ever want to get it, but so I just I just did nothing but identify plants for two weeks straight. And so it took me a long time. Um and I was sort of learning definitely at the time anyway. So I got to about 250 species, I think over that, maybe 260 species when finally I just, I don't know, maybe I got better. Um, and I stopped counting. I didn't, this does not include the grasses. I mean, but it was pretty much everything. Um, and uh, so I have meant to keep, keep that list up, but isn't that incredible? A half an acre has 250, and that was just the ones I counted. It's a lot. And so I, I am sort of roughly keeping a list of insects, but um, you know, there are a lot of little pieces of paper and a lot of different. <laughs> but it, it certainly speaks to the payoff of just being being quiet and paying attention, <laughs> yeah. realizing how much abundance is right there around you. Yeah. Um, and when we talked beforehand about things you weren't going to touch on, but uh, might, there might be questions about the, the, the issue of fields and meadows had come up. And, and so I'm, I'm wondering if you want to speak to that just a little bit mm. in terms of. Um, so um, well, you can you can definitely you if you have a field, um, there's a lot you can do to bring more abundance to your field. Um, that in just just managing it a little differently might I mean you might already have a great program that's perfect, um, but you could try changing your management practices a little bit, changing your mowing regime. Um, a lot of people will mow one time a year in the fall. That's actually a great thing to do one, you know, late, very late fall mow, it's fine. Um, but you could also divide your place your, into a couple of different sections and try actually skipping a year. Don't do the mow one year. You might get, you'll probably get some saplings and you might have to go and, and cut those by hand or weed whacker or whatever. Um, but that's a great thing to try because if you do that, you will get some new species will come in. Some of them will be herbs and um, forbs and, um, uh, and grasses, forbs and grasses um, that you'll want to keep. And so that could be a really interesting thing to try with meadows um, and with fields. Um, again, I, I really can't say enough about paths and make make lots of paths so that you can really get around to all the different places. You may have patches, you might have a patch of something really interesting that you never see because the grass is always so tall in this one spot. And if you have a path there and you can get to it, you realize, oh my gosh, I have blue-eyed grass, which is this cute little grass with these little tiny flowers or you know, just something interesting. Um, and so you do those paths and you know, ticks are a big deal. <laughs> we, I mean, they're a big deal 
even in my yard, my suburban yard, we definitely have them. Um, we don't, I feel like my yard actually doesn't have them the way other yards do. And I don't, I don't know, I don't know why, but um, paths are just great for giving you safe, fit, relatively safe places to go, no matter what you always need to do tick checks every night. I do tick checks twice a day, every day through the season actually. Um, but most people can get away with once a day, but you just, just make sure to do them. And then, then that way you're not afraid. Um, but also, also mow paths. Um, so the mowing thing, I mean, there are a lot of people who mow fields more than once a, once a year, and that's just really not very necessary for most things. Um, so I think, it's really a great thing to do is to divide your field into sections and just have a little bit of a different plan at this section, a different plan for this section and a different one. And then you can compare them and you might, you might end up rotating them. Um, so maybe one is getting mowed in fall this year and another section is going to get it mowed in the spring next year. And then the next one's going to get mowed the following fall, something like that. And they're always kind of in a little rotation. That way you have, um, you have more chances that um, insects and also mammals, little little animals, will be able to kind of move around and kind of like make it and not actually get mowed. You're gonna have a little bit more of that happening. So those are my ideas for, but there are also books on um, meadow management. You, there are a lot of people who are kind of really trying to overhaul their meadow, med, like create, meadows, wildflower meadows, which can be a lot to manage um, and can be a lot to kind of install, which it's just sort of more management than I'm, I do, but some people do that. Is that enough? No. Thanks. And that's, that's, that's helpful. Cause I, and I think the idea of pathways makes a lot of sense too, because, you know, ac you don't want to restrict your access to being able to sort of enjoy the in these special places, but the tick thing is pretty daunting these days. Yeah, yeah. You know, somebody that's gotten Lyme and so. Yeah, careful, definitely. that is. Yep. Unless there are any other questions, I think some people have posted some great um, resources in the chat box and, I'll, and I've been tracking those too. So I'll be sure to include those tomorrow as well, just in case people didn't have a chance to take notes or whatever. But I really appreciate the fact that you really think about the the why as much as, as the how, you know, and this is, this is a great way to be approaching how we, how we love the land that we love, to, that we care about so much. Yeah, yeah, it is. And there's just, you know, there are just these things that we really can do that really make a difference. And I love that. I mean, um, you know, and it, whether it's our own yard or it's uh, the schoolyard where your kids go to school or just, you know, um the, your town office yard you know you could show up and say hey do you want me to do you want me to rewild your the town <laughs> office yard you know like there's just there are things like that and it can bring you know it really brings a lot um to the community to do those kinds of projects so and just and it starts with seeing things differently whether it's seeing an invasive is you know it's not its fault <laughs> it's here or whatever but just seeing things differently yeah, I mean, the invasive stuff is so complex. Did I mention, I meant to mention that um, you, uh, Mid Coast Conservancy might do a uh, uh, invasive species workshop at some point? Yeah, we, we, we almost always do. And I, I'm not sure that we've, it's not on the calendar yet, but we, we will be having one. So, yeah. so anyone interested in, in that should absolutely keep an eye on our um, programs and events page. Yeah, yeah, good. Great. Well, thank you, Lucy. I really, really appreciate you doing this. And thanks to everyone that was part of this. And we'll look forward to sharing um, this and the resources with folks tomorrow who couldn't be here tonight. Okay. Thank you so thank much, Ali. And thank Have you, everybody. Thanks for all that thanks you do. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye.